tuning in to the Portland State University Studio MFA Remote Artist Talk Series. This series is sponsored by generous contributions from the Wingate Foundation and the DePreece Professorship Fund by the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation. We would like to start this event by acknowledging that Portland State University rests on traditional village sites at the of the Montano, Kaklamas, Bands of the Chinook, Toloten, Kalapuya, Molala, and uh, many other tribes who have made their homes along the Columbia River. Multimo is a band of Chinooks that lived in this area, and we thank the descendants of these tribes for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands since time immemorial. This series brings together artists and curators and critics from a variety of disciplines to explore the subjects of their work before a live audience. All of our lectures for winter term are being held remotely and live streamed through our PSU YouTube channel. Please follow our Instagram account at PSU Studio MFA to learn more about artist talks in the future. At the end of this morning's presentation, we'll be having a Q&A with, with Chase and the MFA core cohort, and we will also be fielding questions from the live stream chat. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Chase Hall. Chase Hall was born 1993 in St. Paul, Minnesota, and he lives and works in New York and Los Angeles. He was raised across Minnesota, Chicago, Las Vegas, Colorado, Dubai, Los Angeles, and New York. Hall has been included in exhibitions in the Conchoschale, Basel in Switzerland, Public Art Fund in New York, Museo Tameo in Mexico, Institute of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, Conteceo Cade in Netherlands, and Museo Nacional de San Carlos in Mexico, among others. Chase has been an artist in residence at the Skohagen School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine, the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art in Massachusetts, the Atlantic Center for the Arts under the Catherine Opie in Florida, the Mountain School of Arts in Los Angeles, the Macedonia Institute in Houston Valley, Hudson Valley, among others. His artwork has been featured in the Architectural Digest, Vogue, Vice, ID, Dazed, Forbes, Art Papers, The Atlantic, Garage, The New York Times, and T Magazine. Works by Hall are included in the permanent collections of the Institute of Art in Miami, the Rubel Museum and the Studio Museum in Harlem. Thank you for joining us, Chase, today. And I now open it up to you for this presentation. Hello, Melanie. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And thank you guys for coming to this conversation. I'm really excited to share some of my work. And uh, I've never really been introduced before, Melanie. So that is a very humbling and semi-awkward position. So thank you guys for listening and being here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my keynote. Uh, here we go. And yeah, I wanted to start with my photographic background and how photography has really led me to a place of reciprocity, uh, subject, storytelling, and just like uh, ways to interact with life. I think when I first moved to New York, in 2013, um, I was walking about 15 miles a day, just shooting everything I could, making images with people and of people that really inspired me and also had a place in my heart. Um, and then through that, I set up these roadmaps where I would go to different galleries and museums and start to continue the questions I was having on the street, but now I was having them in these institutions and in these spaces, particularly white spaces and what that felt like, what that meant, and what stories and things I wanted to start dissecting. Um, so a lot of these were found all throughout the boroughs of New York, uh, all across the year. And I was really interested in the ideas of empathy and resilience and familial ideas and notions. Uh, and I think growing up with a single mom, there was definitely a longing um, for a fatherhood, a siblinghood, this kind of disciplinary um, upbringing or imagined mentorship and photography really was the first time I could articulate not only my own personal gaslighting and things that um, have brought me to where I am and things that I've overcome and thought through but also like looking at people as a way to see uh, like a depth or a complexity and I wanted to start depicting that in my work um, more seriously so ideas of black subjectivity 
formidable ideas and notions of looking out and then also ways in which grief longing alcoholism drug addiction in my family and um, different ways you kind of overcome things some overcome things was super important for me to talk about and then more like sculpture and found air uh and found in plain sight type of ideas so i was interested a lot in assemblage and how material and realities could be captured with film and this was the first show that I had. Um, this was in 2017, and it was the first time that I ever um, took things off my, you know, my computer, my negative scanner, and kind of put them into an exhibition. And I started to really have this uncomfortable feeling when I started to realize other people bring their own kind of contextual ideas or projections to the subjects. And that's when I started to really transition from photography as a more personal medium. Um, and then finding ways to discuss it more in performance, um, different areas of sound and music. And then these were more like self-published books I did. So I started to take my photos and create these different zines or books of like black and white color portraits, you know, coffee drawings and all these ways to just start articulating and creating things I could, you know, hand out to friends or sell on my website. Um, I wanted to share this piece because this was one of the only art classes I took when I was very young. Uh, I was about nine years old and I was trying to make Usher funny enough. And then it turned into this more like tribal take. Um, and then there was this wear and erosion happening that in my own familial life, I wanted to kind of translate into the work. And then when I started to move from photography to painting, I was totally entrenched in some more conceptual ideas and the ideas of the ready-made and ideas of like, energy being um, embedded in these things that we touch and give so much value to. So Outcast to me in this shirt was this big, like, you know, a platform for this creative thinking when I was younger that I didn't necessarily have the lexicon or um, the place to kind of give it meaning. So this was as simple as just putting my t-shirt that was ripped up onto a panel. Um, and then I started to look more critically at what it meant to be biracial. What does it look like to have a white mom and a black dad um, growing up with a single mom and how you're always oscillating between the liminal space of whiteness and blackness and both of them being such absolute entities. Um, what does it look like to have both? So that's where a lot of these ideas of balance, coded language, subliminal messaging, logos, color, texture, typography, where all these ideas started to really complicate my own personal identity. And for the first time, I started to think more clearly about nuance and start reauthoring, recontextualizing what it meant when I saw things like the watermelon, what it meant uh, in relationship to our past and how there is almost this um, very peripheral, perpetuated gaze that is put on um, to us as a society and having an excavation or having a reality where I can speak truth to power, almost pull things out of that um, nest, if you will, and then think about them more critically. Uh, this was a doodle type drawing I did um, that was one of the first times I used coffee outside of just like my notebook. Um, I started working with coffee when I was 13, um, working at Starbucks during school or after school. And I would do these doodles and then I would kind of like finger paint some coffee on a receipt. And it was always a way to make marks, thinking about an African bean being traded, brewing in hot water and some of these like metaphysical conceptual ways that um, that blackness you know taking your coffee black all of these ways where I was interacting with this seed and um, there was all these other realities of what coffee meant to me what it meant to jazz and thinking about this uh, this kind of highly caffeinated space during one of those roadmap days of really shooting film all around New York I was at the Met um, where this Gulfstream painting resides. And it was one of the first times I started to really engage with historical American painting um, and giving it space in my heart. I think a lot of the very fleshy Renaissance style paintings that are in the canon of art history actually didn't, my phone's ringing, I'm sorry, one second. Sorry, one second. Um, a lot of this painting to me started to embody uh, my love for surfing, my love for nature, my love for ocean, and then also these turbulent waters um, or kind of ways that you have to interact with real life, but still kind of get through it. And this painting to me really stuck out as like an interesting intersection where I could reauthor the subjectivity. Winslow Homer is a very famous painter who is white. 
some of these kind of muse gaze paintings to me are an interesting way to almost reclaim and relook. Um, and that was really when I started to engage with American painting outside of the last 30 years, but kind of in the larger umbrella of American history. Um, this was a piece that was inspired by the story of Jocko Graves, who was an enslaved kid at Mount Vernon. So the story goes where during the Battle of Trenton, uh, George Washington put him in charge of like keeping the lights on and having the horses and making sure they had water and all these things. And he really wanted to go into the battle. And when they left, he like made it his duty to show how hard he would work or how much he could give this stable and, you know, in a way trying to get this like somewhat of a promotion in kind of like a sick twisted way. And while they were gone, um, he ended up taking his job so seriously that he ended up um, freezing to death in the front of this state with a lantern still ablaze. And that over the last hundreds of years has been dehumanized into the lawn jockey that we're familiar with today. Um, that you'll see kind of around the Northeast or the South or even out here. Uh, right now I'm in Los Angeles, but this piece to me was really a point where I could think about sculpture, found sculpture, assemblage, painting, and then historical painting and kind of complicated with this rope that's actually coming out of the horse's bit. Um, I was very interested in the horse as a trope and a symbol um, because my mom was a horse trainer. Um, so we moved a lot going to different places where horses were active and whether you're seeing them in the wild or seeing them in more of an equestrian setting, I was always questioning where my blackness resided in these places and how my interaction with horses were actually a lot more spiritual or personal than they were um, literal or like prestigious in any way. And it felt like the relationships I was having with some of these animals had a, a reality and an honesty that I couldn't necessarily find I'm um, in real time, especially at a younger age, you know, and I've been to the mountaintop as a reference to Martin Luther King's speech. And to me, it was like during 2017, 2018, there was a lot of personal um, transcendence. And I really was if, trying to embody this idea of like, if you've made it through the worst, what's on the other side and who can you take with you? And what does that look like? Um, these were some more just straight on portraits or portrait um, I've shared this one because it was one of the first times I include I included white as a paint. Um, as you see in some of the marks in his coat, there's also this whiteness that is actually from the cotton canvas. And I started to take that more seriously in some paintings um, that you'll see coming up. Uh, this was a piece that was called Fishing with Dad. Um, I recreated these folky type lawn ornaments from a tri-cut metal cast from 1906. And I was interested in what that erosion and grayness meant in relationship to being in between. But obviously there is a black figure in the ways that we've fetishized and tokenized the eyes, nose and mouth, which you'll see in some later paintings I started to take more seriously as uh, confronting and interrogating that whiteness, interrogating that cotton. Um, and then here thinking more about how that wear or that pain is almost this daily um, grin and bear it type of thing. Um, and in relationship to Fred Moten's in the break, the, the idea behind black improvisation and kind of getting through it and like what we wear on our sleeve or the chips we have on our shoulder. Um, and then growing up with incarcerated parents, there was this reality of like who teaches you to fish, um, who teaches you to become, who teaches you these things. And when you're pulling from rap, black exploitation films, coded languages and advertisements and the ways that the systems has like system has told us what to be and where to be and why I started to really complicate that and think about like oh a park bench in New York in the park versus this bench that I'm using from these police barricades was a way to try and yeah, complicate and communicate how nice it would be to just sit and kind of talk shop but instead the realities of over policing liquor stores and generational traumas and lack of education have mutated something into uh, an incredibly devastating position. And speaking from my family in Omaha and Minnesota, the realities that are entrenched around where they live uh, are something that I take really seriously in the work and how I can question and interrogate what it looks like to just be in proximity to such uh, intense systems. This is where I started to really uh, take ownership of the slippage and complications of also being half white. Um, there's definitely a three-fifths of man complex and questioning what 
duality and hybridity can mean in its absolute form. So here I was interested in this found cherub sculpture that I was then able to paint black and still treat its whiteness as this like seduction um, and speaking into that fetishization of blackness. So growing up being one of the whitewashed, light-skinned black kids, my first 13 years of my life, and then the second um, moving into a white space where I was one of the only black kids in my class was a really interesting way to see the dichotomy and that kind of switch up in the peripheral racism that was happening in so many ways that I didn't have um, a way to really speak on. And this was an interesting way to talk about how that whiteness is actually used in a way where people feel hyper close to you or uh, accelerate these relationships when in reality, it's just a, a nuance that has to continue to um, have some, for, some sort of discourse. And that's what a lot of the work is. Um, I was younger and the idea of like going with the wind was always kind of this assimilation tactic as I moved a lot of schools and played different sports and um, tried to just throw myself into many different arenas. I was interested in what it meant to deal with such longing and mourning during a lot of these school shootings that were happening um, in the last 10, 15 years. I was so just devastated by that and I was interested in what it looked like to recontextualize a lot of these found objects that have this whimsical kind of naivete boyish charm but are still in, incredibly embedded and constrained in historical ideas and symbols and objecthoods that I can speak on and then continue to complicate or um, in a way like create riddles and Rubik's cubes uh, to work through some of the pain and experiences this painting I actually am not too interested in, but I wanted to share it because it was the first time I really started to think about the cotton as a material, as a background, and as a um, oppositional like material gaze. So when I started to create paintings on top of this cotton, I couldn't run from what I was actually using to create the painting. And in this one, it was like, that whiteness all around was something that I could actually go with and move with and think through. Um, and this is in a time when I was making a lot of these black and white paintings, um, thinking about identity and thinking about how tonally I could work through the tones of blackness and create this, this space between both. Um, and obviously the Sisyphus story of like getting to the top and falling back down, but then all we can do is kind of stand up and get back to the top uh, is something I think about in uh, all the ways in which life kind of throws wrenches into your uh, situation, but you have to remain steadfast and just kind of working through it. This was a, a piece called Spoon on His Lap, and it was actually an old percussive uh, spoons player in an old blues documentary I was looking at, but it almost doubled as this relationship to drug addiction drug addiction that has really hindered my personal family. And I wanted to play in between how something, a tool or a object like the spoon can then totally like be used in ways that are for things that are positive and then also things that are negative and that like complicated in between section is really interesting to me. Um, this was a piece when I started to think about an agrarian approach to painting and some more American ideals of like agriculture, the fruits of your labor, low hanging fruit, a lot of these idioms I started to think about and how I could create this unavoidable whiteness that was like peering through some of the shapes and objects I was working with. And then a lot of the early work were these racist cartoons and kind of past Jim Crow era objects and I started to get really grossed out once the viewership started to become more serious and I really needed to make a stance of like this has more to do about whiteness and the cryptic languages used to dehumanize blackness and forms to make money ownership and promote white supremacy so when I could flip that narrative I was doing it in a way that didn't have enough context um, I will you know admit wholeheartedly just needing to yell to get it off of my chest and then in this piece I wanted to title it The Fall of the White Imagination to really kind of tie a bow on some of that research for me where I realized it was a form of oppression for myself and in my imagination and working past it, working through it has been really important. But in order to get to some of the places I'm in now, I was really interested in how and why um, all of these stereotypes were the way that they were. I, so I started to think more about my proximity to whiteness, my proximity to lakes, um, 
being close to, you know, campy behavior, leisure activity, but always be in question as like the only black person there. So I started to think about my grandpa hunting and this kind of like Titan-esque heroic gaze that I always looked up to um, and how that tied into the music that my grandparents would listen to a lot uh, when I was little. So thinking about jazz and how that has transformed into hip hop and thinking about this generational sound and what that meant, where it came from. And as you can see in the nose here, I leave it white to talk about these fetishized areas like his nose, his mouth and his crotch. But I also wanted there to be these ideas of pareidolia. So if you look in the nose again, you start to see this white viewer almost like acting overly enlightened as he's hearing this sound for the first time, kind of like praying on his knees, like, oh, this blackness, all of that sweat equity, pain and trauma is somehow creating a scapegoat or an apathetic lens for me to get through my own thing. When in reality, I was more interested in the music he was playing, but to interrogate my own biraciality, there was a need to talk about how this cotton actually doubles as so many things and how can I start playing with pareidolia and pareidolia is like when you see Jesus in the toast or monsters in the clouds or it's all about the projection of the viewer or of self um, but in that there is a very animalistic reality that goes back hundreds and thousands of years um, this piece was called Single Mom's Boys Choir. I was really interested in where you go for extracurricular activities when no one is at your house. And if they are at your house, what's going on there? Um, so I think in my upbringing around like drugs and violence and uh, areas that I didn't necessarily want to continue to participate in, I started to really use my camera as a way to just get out of the house and go around places. And then I started to really distill and almost wring out the sponge of all these things I was seeing in real time. So after school, I was the kid who would go to the Boys and Girls Club um, or these different key clubs or places where you could go uh, interact with kids for other kids who didn't necessarily have a nanny or a home um, to go to or pick them up. Um, a lot of these pieces I made during a show that I did out of my studio that was called Troubled Waters. And that was in February of 2020, a month before COVID and months before the social upheaval through Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, um, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd. And there was this interesting intersection where a lot of these paintings started to like double up in real time. And it just made me feel very like cringy and scared. Um, and really understand the depth in which these devastating realities have just been going on for thousands of years. Just now we have a camera phone to um, share the atrocities publicly. Um, so for me, this piece, 4th of July, was based on this idea of like even celebrating something comes at this constraint. And is it him in a thinker's position or is it this whiteness, um, this superiority complex? It's almost stopping him from breathing. Um, this was an interesting painting because I titled it the season finale and this was before COVID and now to me the last year really has been the season finale type of feeling. I'm actually a lot less interested in this painting than I was when I made it and I'm trying to remove myself from like reauthoring Black pain. I think um, it gets, it's a very sticky trap to talk about what I've been through personally, but then also what I want to talk about and I think over this last year really distilling some of the ideas of narrative, of cinema, of instrumentation, of sound, of color, they actually can live by themselves. They don't have to be completely tied to really devastating things. Uh, I think that form of oppression and like bringing it back up needs to have a very specific and deep context. Otherwise you're almost like working for the enemy. And I was interested in, you know, being in water, being some sort of a person that could take this damage and bring it somewhere and thinking about the other side of this and almost like a George Bellows, uh, Andrew Wyeth type painting where I was thinking about the Northeast meeting with this kind of Western and like, what does it mean to call for reinforcements? What does it mean to have this innate feeling that someone you love is in trouble and like, who's going to come? Where, where are the reinforcements? And that's what a lot of this painting uh, for me was like what I was meditating on during the making. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, scuba diving or surfing or being on the beach or these very like white activities, I like to complicate and just reauthor and create a black nuance in order to see black nuance in our future. I was interested in what that Blue Lives Matter flag meant in the corner with this kind of 
pelican wrapping through it and wrapping through it but then there was this crow behind it suggested in that cotton space and how there was this um, like going deep idea into the ocean and these like black men just on the, the bottom of the earth bottom of the ocean to me was a very interesting position that I actually haven't seen um, and seeing to believe is kind of an interesting way I like to think about a lot of the paintings um, Nick Gabaldon was one of the first documented black surfers he's actually um, Latino and Black, grew up on the Inkwell Beach uh, here in Los Angeles, which was like Venice Beach, Santa Monica. Um, and he would actually paddle, I believe it was around 20 miles to the Malibu Pier and surf where uh, a lot of like the best waves or other surfers. And I was really interested in like what it meant to not be able to get on the bus, to not have a car, but to still give yourself to your sport, give yourself to your community or your environment and still like not take no as an answer. Um, so for me, a lot of it is creating these vigils or almost like ways to look up to parts of our history that weren't necessarily taught in school, but through research, I'm able to investigate and reassert the importance of talking about these stories and who they are. Um, the idea of drinking and smoking for me is a very like self-prescribed black man's therapy trope. Um, and I think like smoking through the pain or looking at things through a lens of grief and longing has this relationship to addiction that I think is un, like undeniable. Um, in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of families and people I've interacted with and how they get over things usually is like exercise therapy or addiction and how that leads into other things. And this piece smoked fish. I was interested in this guy kind of smoking his doobie after getting his fish, but then this kind of white spirited like horror happening in the back that was still like, is it a happy landscape? Is it a sad landscape? Are there people? Is he seeing things? Are they envisioned? Is he really alone? Like for me, those were a lot of why I can suggest shapes and forms, but in, in reality, a lot of it is um, narrative ideas between the subjects and relationships to my childhood where I'm learning how to fish or I'm learning what it feels like to be around a bunch of white fishermen that actually don't want you to be in your own boat on their lake or things like that. So generational coastal communities have a very generationally wealthy uh, kind of like pathetic uh, localism. And for me, the water uh, is acted upon in this way that like someone owns it when in reality, like the death of my ancestors in the water has like immense ownership instead of like land that was then like colonized by people that were oppressive. Um, so like really, non mal or like a non-linear history a malleability to insert yourself and stories in places that weren't necessarily told but still existed is really interesting and fun for me to interact with how i can talk speak my truth and still tell stories um i mentioned earlier the fred moten book in the break that was really influential for me because i started to think of black improvisation i started to take a closer look at jazz and i started to think about how jazz came from the reworking of colonial instruments that came here on a boat um, and the idea that orchestra or symphony or this kind of uh, composition could not only happen in my own color or in my own stroke but also in these ideas of reforming what these instruments did and who could use them and what does it sound like now and how has that actually morphed into all of these other sounds that we're left with today um, and this was a piece that I did for the Public Art Fund group show where we put up um, a bunch of different artwork on bus stops from a bunch of different artists. And I was interested in this photo that I just kind of grew up with of all of these old jazz legends. Um, and I was interested in just reauthoring the image, um, thinking, at, thinking about it again and letting the coffee act more as like an oscilloscope or a spirit field in the background and letting these subjects uh, kind of work as these people looking out like a confrontation. Dexter Gordon was an artist that I really look up to and I was interested in how this idea of like smoking, coughing, coffee, coughing, jazz, sound all have these like very, um, it's almost like a whirlwind of realities and what does it mean to create something that is static when there's so much going on, not only in his head, not only in the instrument, but just overall. This piece was called Porch Sound. I'm sorry, that's Paisley. Big Great Dane, just itching her collar. So sorry about the noise. But um, yeah, Porch Sounds was this 
just reality of like hearing people play music in Omaha and Minnesota when I visit my family. And there was just this depth that I didn't find other places. So I wanted to find a way to really have like a mind, body, hand, stroke connection where like these stories and experiences can speak their truth. Uh, and then this piece was called The Lifeguard. Uh, this was actually one of the only pieces that I've shared that I've made post-March. Um, just because I've been taking a deep dive into stilling my work and my process and really trying to achieve more. Um, this was a piece that I was just interested in the idea of someone like guarding life. Um, it has a very religious stance with, you know, the subject's arms looking like a cross, but there's this diving board almost like she's going to kind of backflip into this lake and purify something. And there are these paradolic subject suggestions behind her, more of those energy fields I talked about. And then the idea of a black lifeguard to me was just really exciting and putting my life in someone's hand that I saw a kinship with, um, felt a lot more closely related to than some of the lifeguards that I knew personally or places where I'll see them. And then the studio for me is like an incredibly special place where nothing really comes close to the feelings. Um, so on that same note, doing shows out of the studio for me is a way to really like interact with your peers and artists and communities. And I definitely advise like renting little pop-up spaces and doing your own stuff and just like getting people that you really care about to come see the work and start conversation. I think a lot of these um, little DIY shows I did have really allowed me to think about my work in a way that has leverage and equity and like learning more of the back end of like, what does it look like to get a space, to clean a space, to hang your show or whatever, but really also just treat your studio as this like membrane or nucleus for so much and really giving it the honesty and truth and freedom that I long for in real reality, but letting my studio be this kind of nest egg where I can bring all of those things in. Um, and still think about them critically. Um, so I'll kind of scoop through a few of these. And then this is a studio I'm working out of now, which is an old jazz club on West Adams here in Los Angeles. And these are just like little, I guess, caveat images. This is upstairs, the mezzanine kind of looking down some of the bigger paintings. And I think it's been interesting to talk more seriously about world building, about space, about objects, about paintings and how they can all triangulate and then collapse in a very complicated and personal way. Um, but talking through these ideas of like leading by example, leaving it all on the field, working through pain, trauma, emotion in your work and letting it transcend you into some sort of uh, version of yourself that wasn't there before. And I think when I think about music or jazz or movies or documentaries, we all have a lexicon and a social contract where we allow them to affect us. But I was never under the impression where paintings could have that same possibility. And seeing the Henry Taylor uh, piece that's in the MoMA collection in 2013 for the first time ever being at like a kind of artsy, artsy museum um, just changed my life. I mean, crying in front of a piece personally was the first time where I was like, oh, it's doing exactly what Training Day did to me or Good Kid Mad City or you know, John Coltrane or Gil Scott Heron or Bobby Womack. And like, I was able to, for the first time, find a plane or find a space where I could speak my truth um, and let it be this you know, colorful, textural, conceptual storytelling block that allowed me to kind of, um, I don't know, use it as a cauldron where I almost stir in my interests, my influences, my pain, my emotion, my um, nomadic up upbringing and like, excavating parts from that is really interesting and pulling out things to kind of look more closely at. Um, and that was the gist of my practice and things I'm thinking about and what um, I'm looking into in the future. And I definitely wanted to put my email up here, my website, just if any of you guys have more specific questions or you didn't want to speak out in the Q&A or over the next days or weeks or whatever, just making sure that there was an artist to artist reciprocity there and any way to talk about work or ask questions, influences. You know, I definitely am a, a total nerd in the sense that like, I'm in the studio from, you know, 5.30 in the morning to 11 at night, painting, questioning, building, reading, um, listening to talks, using the internet as a friend and as a source instead of as an enemy. And really thinking about all of the archival details and realities that, so many brilliant scholars, writers, and thinkers have um, put up for us. 
Uh, also, I've been reading a lot of August Wilson's playwrights and focusing more seriously about character development, what that looks like. And then also, you know, uh, Stuart Hall's essays and this idea behind being and becoming at the same time. Um, that has been really transformative space to situate myself um, in my practice and how I'm thinking about the last year moving into the future. It's like um, growing pains and stepping into that next world and letting your work speak your truth, but still just trying to absorb and learn and research and develop um, in real time as well. Um, so I, I guess I'll stop sharing my screen and now I'm back, but yeah, thank you guys. Thanks, Chase. That was a wonderful talk. It was great to see you talk about your work and um, hear the poetics that you use. You're like such a poetic person as you're discussing. You, um, I guess um, maybe we can open up some, uh, open it up to questions from the students. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um. <clears throat> I think one of the things that uh, really stands out to me with your work is your handling of the paint and like the brush strokes and then how that's uh, intermixed with the raw canvas. And I, um, I guess, I don't know how much of a question it is, but for me, I read that as so interrelated um, to the jazz influence. Like it feels very musical and rhythmic. Um, and I was wondering if, if, yeah, I guess if that was um, involved with that, that kind of stylistic development or sort of where you kind of brought that from, or if that was just intrinsic? Yeah, um, so I think for me, I, I've worked for a few older artists and I really started to admire how for the first time I saw someone accept that they loved color, that they loved light, that they loved texture. And it wasn't this thing that was super patronizing and like, oh yeah, like art buddy to know. I was like, oh no, this is actually giving my life meaning. And like the way Stanley Kubrick will frame a, you know, frame a scene is the same way I could frame a painting or the way that, you know, uh, Eric Dolphy is just, you know, free jazz going crazy on a song. Like I have that same freedom to go crazy on a painting. Um, so I think in terms of like using the cotton uh, negative space, that idea of negative space, the idea of this cotton being white, this idea of being an American painter who is both black and white. I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, be in it and not of it. I couldn't separate the material from my story because it felt like I was lying to myself. So the idea of using coffee, um, using cotton and then using paint was a way to really activate things in real life that have like a quotidian element. Like found pigment to me was thinking about Clifford Still and abstract artists of the fifties that were doing like these very, um, you know, audacious manly things and like I would go into a, a museum and be like oh like this dude ran out of paint you know or like whatever kind of like corny joke and then I started to actually get way more infused with like the audacity of saying it is something that it is not the idea that I could bring someone to talk about cotton in my paintings just as not even using a white paint um, so for me I think when I started to develop um, a more like you know, dare I say inventive or personal stroke or take on building a subject, I was really interested in how, um, when I look around the artistic world now, a lot of things lean on each other, if you will. And I just wanted to make sure that my story, the identity I talk about, the gender that I am, the experiences I've had could all be in one thing where I wouldn't necessarily have to yell as loud as I was previously. Um, and then when people start to see the seed broken down into that whiteness, and then there's these black specks in the canvas, like I couldn't be black and American without thinking about American landscape, American history, and this cotton being something more than just a place where my paint went. So I wanted to talk about that whiteness as a negative space, both personally in my own triple helix of DNA, but also as a highlight when I'm thinking about color and tone and composition. Um, and I think it was uh, a lot of my early paintings would be like, oh, that looks like a Henry Taylor, or like that looks like a Robert Colescott, or that, that. And you know, yeah, I walk on the shoulders of giants. I pray to many artists that I, you know, read their receipts, if you will. But when I was able to think about found pigment, think about cotton, think about this blackness and whiteness, I just felt a lot of opportunity to start talking to my 13 year old self and not be like, you know, to quote Earl Sweatshirt, like, 
too black for the whites, too white for the blacks. Like that's a very much the space where I'm thinking about my work um, and how conceptually I'm interested in art being something huge and uh, mind bending. I'm not as interested in like doing the perfect hit of paint because for me, I allow my camera to be perfection and to be light and to be realistic, but the, the poetics or the depth and the complexity, I can't articulate to you. When I'm listening to my music, I'm in the studio, I'm thinking about things like, there's no language I can develop to talk about what that means to me. And like, I just wanted there to be a place that I could give something meaning other than it just being like, does this look directly like a bunch of Buffalo soldiers or does it look a little bit tweaked? And like in that tweak, um, is there a potential for authorship? Um, and thinking about like, there's some artist's hands that you just can't deny. And, and to me, I just wanted my hand to be very present. I mean, my grandma uh, would always say like the fastest way to a viewer's heart is in the artist's hand. And the idea of seeing paintings and people making and this idea of creativity, just unadulterated freedom in a way. Um, those are all the like very romantic ideas of painting and creating that I think about. And in terms of like, how did I think of the cotton or the, the, um, the kind of negative space? I think it really was just about practicing practice. I studied uh, under Simone Forti during the mountain school residency. And that was one thing that she would always say, she, you know, the idea of practicing your practice, like that kind of was mind blowing to me because it's like, oh, if I have a space and I can continue to develop myself, my work, my stories, uh, my engagement of compositions and colors and tones, like I'm very happy. I don't need to do all these other things because like I mentioned, what I felt in front of Henry's piece, 2013, crying in the MoMA, it's like no one can tell me that paintings don't have the potential to be life-changing because it happened to me. Um, so I was less interested in trying to prove it to others and more just trying to fulfill this like incredible guttural, like deep place that I didn't actually have any emotional reciprocity, like in my world outside of painting or outside of photography. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's about truth telling. It's about freedom. And it was so much about like, this is what I'm going to do. And no one could say or take that away from me. Um, and that was kind of the chip on my shoulder that I've always situated it myself in. It's like, if I'm reading about how other people have made pigments or thinking about how the cotton has meant things for someone else. And like, you know, that to me was really exciting. And I just wanted to think about material more seriously. You know, I, I look at um, Mark Bradford paper. I'm thinking about David Hammonds. I'm thinking about rocks. I'm thinking about Whitfield Lavelle. I'm thinking about the found object. I'm thinking about Betty Saar. I'm thinking about clocks, ships. Um, the mammy figure, the doll, how can those all be extra extrapolated and so present, but also so individual. So for me, the coffee became this way to claim a material that is so quotidian and so accessible that it almost haunts the viewer where it's like, oh, I'm starting my day and I'm going to have coffee and I'm thinking about the work now. Or you had a nice, you know, Italian dinner, you're having espresso to leave and you're like, oh, wow, this is the same thing that's in the backgrounds of these paintings and like letting that there, there's no separation to me and like removing those walls has made a very um, a very like verdant soil that I'm just trying to like keep planting seeds in um, but yeah <laughs> yeah that uh, that's fascinating yeah there's so many good things with that <laughs> yeah thank it's you for thank you thank you for your help on um, the project of Black Puffin that was like to me one of uh the, the highlights of the year so thank you oh yeah I mean thank you for being a part of it that was that was the same that was such a fun that was so cool yeah I agree the way that you discuss materials is so sculptural to me um it's really interesting um and it's really interesting to see the trajectory of your work starting with photography and then moving into sculpture and then moving towards like to, to painting um, I guess like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the way that you um, line up the poetics of materials with history, but it's like being an educator, I also start thinking about trauma in relation to your work, right? And the discussion of trauma through the historical. Um, I think oftentimes within art systems, we're dissuaded from discussing trauma, but in your case, you do it effectively through history. Um, I guess I was wondering if you could speak more to that. Yeah, it's, it's complicated, I think, because, you know, I, 
I definitely was caught up in the trap of like reissuing black pain, black trauma. And I think that that's a very common ground for a lot of people's practices because there is so much anger that you just want to like yell, you know, Gary Simmons had a show that was called like screaming into the void or something last year, right? When COVID was starting and like, oh, screaming into the ether, I'm sorry. And like that to me was a, such a poignant way to like talk about that feeling of just like, you're just kind of like lost and almost, uh, yeah, yelling in the wind. And I think for me, uh, the reality that we all have darkness and pain uh, should be normalized. It'll create more complex, dense relationships that have like a reality and a truth to it. I was less interested in this kind of like, oh, everything's super chill. Like I'm just lucky to be alive and make my work. And like, to me, it just felt very, uh, like shallow I know that behind everyone's eyes there's so much more and like why can't am I still you know engulfed in so much shame that I can't even bring up some of my hardest days or can I use it as a way to like remind people that through that resilience and like picking yourself up that's like the the trust the process or like the reward is the process type of thing that I think about where it's like oh, I have a place to go speak truth to power. I have a place to go question history. I have a place to make my marks and have my subliminal messaging and talk about aesthetics. Um, and I think, you know, moving from, uh, moving around the United States and having these experiences that were traumatic, it's like, it just felt like telling my truth. Um, I really wanted to be authentic and I wanted kids to know that like, yeah, there's so much stuff that's so messed up that like you have to hide and hold on and like you get all shaky, you have anxiety, you start doing all these other like messed up things that like lead you down a rabbit hole of like destruction. And I've seen it personally, I've seen it in my friends, I've seen it in my family and like I don't have shame in overcoming things that have been really challenging and overcoming things that society have placed a stigma on to not talk about. And I think in the work, you know, we can listen to Tupac's anthology discography and be like, wow, this is all pain and trauma. But through that, there is a density and a reality that actually has you being seen for the first time. When I listen to music that has power and pain and the whole kind of gamut of feeling, that to me is actually a lot more interesting than just listening to mainstream music that's really positive. Um, so I think in the work, like, in order, there, in order for there to be a conversation, the darkness and the sadness to me is a much more uh, important thing to discuss than the kind of the lens of like everything is okay, because it's not. Um, and I think that's what the ceiling being ripped off of the world the last year has really shown so many other people um, is that it's like, oh, all that gaslighting, all the questioning, all those like racist interactions and all that stuff like whatever that you knew was wrong, like was wrong then and it is still wrong. And I've always had the chance to know it, call a spade a spade, like, hey, that made me feel wrong. And you know that that was wrong. And then, you know, previously in school or whatever, be like, oh no, man, like you're, it's all good. It's like, no, it's not all good. Um, and, I, and I actually want to create a space where I can call that stuff out. Um, so I'm much more interested in like a Trojan horse type of space where I can get into the room, force myself into the conversation and then actually bring, you know, all of these conversations and things that I'm really thinking about into that um, same world. But I think living a lie, a lot of this kind of like pretend stuff, it just started to really create a life that wasn't honest to me. And I wasn't interested in like stepping into lying every day. I was much more interested in stepping into kind of the smoke or the fire of like my own feelings in a way. Right. I, I, I think this last year, like, I, I think there's been a lot of conversations around resilience, right? Sure. But it's like what I am notice, noticing around uh, about those conversations around resilience was that it was very narrow in scope. Like um, I was searching for, um, well, languages that could take into account the way that coping mechanisms also become part of that resilience, right? 100%. Um, but it's like, sometimes like our, our intersectionalities aren't ne don't necessarily fit within like um, community spaces that kind of discuss resilience in, I guess in a much more objective way. 
Um, but I guess I was I was thinking about that in, in terms of how you talked about the trickiness of reauthoring pain. Yeah. Um, and you kind of discussed the uh, the way that it needs a specific and deep context. And the way that I was interpreting that is that um, if you don't have that specific and deep context, then it has pitfall, like, you know, it goes into the pitfalls of neutrality. Mm -hmm. And I, I was also wanting to learn more about that. Like, you know, when you were talking about the need for a specific and deep context, can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, I think um, for me, when I started really looking more closely at like Bell Hooks writing or Stuart Hall, like I mentioned, I started to see um, a lot of the subjectivity and the idea of just like putting things out actually doesn't have as much potential growth as like language behind it. So this tethering be between whiteness and blackness and this kind of, uh, you know, newer reality in a way, like actually getting it on paper, like what does this feel like? Um, what am I experiencing? What are the micro traumas that are then compounding interest in this kind of personality swaying from one way to another? And how can you just be yourself? I think the context for me was like, I'm more interested every day I get less and less interested in the past and more and more interested in what do I do with it? What is the alchemic potential? What comes next? Um, so I think when I talk about context, it's important for me to actually specify what things are happening, but then also how I'm taking them to new places. And the context I mentioned in the beginning of the conversation was just in relationship to people's real lives. Like I was making images of portraits of people in the world and people started to dissect the conversation to be about their relationship to otherness instead of my relationship to friendship, mentorship, fatherhood, all these other things that like I really wanted the, the viewer to understand. But due to the lack of context, they started interacting in it with these subjects and in these ways that actually had nothing to do with the conversation I was trying to have. And that was really eye-opening where I kind of was like, oh, I actually need to be way more thorough when I'm building an exhibition, when I'm talking about who's writing the text, when I'm looking at other artists or a group show. Did, are the other artists in the group show exciting to you? Do you, you know, and like it started to be like, if my name is on it and I'm dealing with very heavy things personally and historically, I have to make sure that my, you know, dotting my I's, crossing my T's and doing the research of the great thinkers and writers before me. I think when I think about context and I think about what the lens I'm coming from, a lot of it is a lived personal experience. And, you know, it's like, I'm interested in writing more than I am necessarily rereading, but I think it is a, a bit of both for me. And just the more I develop my research, the more the language and specificity of the work just becomes pointed and has a direction and a space instead of it being like a theoretical uh, in a way. Roger, thank I you. I thank you for the presentation. Um, when you're talking about language, I guess for me, there's an important distinction between visual language and then language, you know, words or labels and signifiers. Right. And, um, and you're also talking about black nuance or um, nuance in, in blackness or uh, being mixed race. Um, and I just feel like it, it's part of also talking about uh, trauma or difficult life events. Um, I think that the use of language that's visual um, can offer a much more uh, or can allow for much more nuance and much more flexibility that, than um, words or labels that can feel much more um, constraining maybe or specific in, in some ways, but then lacking um, a way to, to describe other more complex situations. So I, I don't know what, what you think about that distinction between language being visual, because I feel like your work is communicating so much um, visually to me, and, and you're talking about it great in, in the language that you're using to talk about it. But I, I just feel like for me, I, I respond so much visually and I can um, communicate much more visually in terms of trauma and personal experiences than through language. Yeah, I think um, the Glissons writing about opacity is really interesting. Some, some things about like I actually don't have to say anything about my work and you guys can, you know, assume and project all the days and, you know, hey, I'll just take a step back. Um, and then there's also the idea of language, like 
being able to recognize something takes some way to articulate it. But so much of art is articulating the unarticulatable. So for me, I completely agree. It's like, I could say all these things that you look at this and you're just thinking about like a Ferris wheel you saw when you're six years old and you shed a tear. It's like amazing. You know, that doesn't deteriorate my take on the work. It just has totally entered a different sphere when the viewership um, becomes involved. And I think that there is a, a space where you prepare your work and your context and your the world you're building around it. But when it is up, it, it is off of your hands. It is very much off of your hands and people will read and project all these things. But I think it's interesting to have people excited, people sad, people happy, people really pissed. I think the best work in the world, people hate um, and also love at the same time. Um, so it is this very uh, opaque and unarticulatable feeling that I'm really trying to like uphurl um, a bit. But yeah, I think in terms of seeing your own visuals and that brings in your own personal narratives, it's like, that's amazing. I want this to be a Pandora's box of a practice. It's like, I like the sculptures, I like the paintings, I like being able to make images, but I'm much more interested in like humanity and real time change, this kind of ripple effect. What are people bringing into the conversation? How do they see these things? It's like very much about, uh, yeah, re reciprocity. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Melanie? I was curious if you could talk about like what growing pains or like difficulties you experience when first starting out as an artist and if you had any advice for young artists that are trying to dive into this world. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, it's interesting because being self-taught, I'm just someone who literally was just on YouTube listening to every artist I ever liked and people talk, older artists that other people liked and like I just started to make all day start early keep working late and all in the practice i'm just constantly note taking constantly listening constantly thinking absorbing and then through that um you know there's like a compounding interest meaning over time those those valleys and all that erosion of like caring about your practice and finding the language actually get bigger and bigger so i think that was the main thing is that i knew i was working every day i knew i was learning every day and over the last 10 years just really dedicating every day of the week to that. Um, and I think the growing pains that come with that is you start to realize there's a huge sacrifice of having deep conversations and deep research. So maybe there's not as many romantic nights with your girlfriend or hanging out with your friends, watching the Laker game or walking the dog just to walk the dog. But it actually means when I'm interacting with them now, they actually have a lot more value and they're not kind of like, oh yeah, another day hanging out with da 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 it's like they actually have a lot more meaning. So I think the growing pains for me were like, at what point do I stop having to tell myself, you're, you're good, this is art, this is a conversation. And I was just more interested in doing the work at home so that when I was interacting in more critical spaces like a Scalhegan or like an art to artist talk or all these things, like I just wanted to make sure that I was, when, I, when someone called on me, I wouldn't sound dumb and that I knew I was speaking my truth. Those are my main things. It was like the chip on my shoulder to be smarter than any person with an MFA was just from reading, reading, reading and, and giving and giving and giving and practicing and practicing and practicing. I think the growing pains happen when you start to have to realize like not everyone's in this for the right reason and not everyone has your intention. Um, and I think that the growing pains come from like the fear tactics and like social questioning of social media and not being a part of things or not being selected. And like, there's plenty of shows or awards or grants, all these things I apply for that I never get. And then every those little things where people are like, Oh my God, you're da, da, da. it's like, yo, I just like got denied 25, 24 times. Um, and just to get back up and be like, oh, that actually doesn't define me or my work. Like, I'm not ready. I got to keep making my work better. And like being okay with failures. You know, I had a studio visit with Hamza Walker the other day, obliterated my practice. And it felt great because now it's like I'm mosaicing it back. 
and I'm finding these other ways where that little bit of air squeaking out, oh, now it's airtight. You know, like there are parts where you get to react to those growing pains and continue to give thing and give things a name or give things meaning. Um, but I think as long as it's like a dedicated thing, like you can't bullshit it. Um, I think that is a very much a 10,000 hours thing and putting yourself into the room. You know, I, I moved to New York and relentlessly spent every bit of sunlight making images. And then every night I was going to talks, openings, bars, playing pool, offering free labor, packing up other people's stuff, building out some studio, some older artists, like really making yourself available, putting yourself in the room and like, you know, metaphorically, I'm the kid at the skate park that's like with my helmet, knee pads, elbow pads, like, oh, I just want to skate and like learn from you guys. And I just love it here. I'm so passionate. Like, that's my whole MO. And like, I really believe in like a magnetism of true passion and like true knowledge. Like if you, if you really care about something, you're surrounding yourself with people who really care. Like that to me seemed like a recipe to just keep learning. And that's, that was my main thing is like, if I can make paintings and I could continue to learn um, I just want to be able to do that for the rest of my life. And there's a the reality of residencies and building community and the, the brilliant people you share space and time with, like that to me has been the most profound experience. Like um, I would advise residencies, 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 fellowships, 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 get your own little warehouse in North Dakota for three months and go do your own thing. Like with no name on it, no meritocracy, no gatekeeping, like make it happen. Um, take these risks and like put yourself in a space where like, this is just as valuable as any other job. Um, and if not one of the most like shamanistic and spiritual and like unspoken truth uh, space is possible. But yeah, it really, it really has just been about, you know, signing my name in the dotted line metaphorically. Like I am willing to work for free, rewatch talks, paint all day, all night, and not even like what I'm making and throw it out, try it again tomorrow. Um, and like that to me was the main thing was like, put yourself in the room and do the work because when that opportunity comes up to talk to an artist you really admire or a curator who's kind of not even interested in you, like those moments of like, oh, he, he's actually interested in a lot of the things I'm interested in. We can have a dialogue now instead of being like, hey, pick me, pick me, pick me. It's like the idea that you had for me, like making myself um, have these conversations and putting myself into the room and like realizing no one's going to be violent if they say no you know you go up to someone hey I really love your work I'd love to have a moment of your time they say all right great what do you like about it or like thanks leave me alone you know it's like one of the two and if you get them leave me alone you're like all right peace like you're gonna see one day I'm a really good artist you know and like you take it to heart and you keep working it out and then if you are able to open up a dialogue with another artist you really admire or a friend or whatever then you have a relationship to maybe have a studio visit, to maybe have them come into your space. Maybe you don't want them in your space, but you can talk about like random comic books you both have. And like now there's a new visual dialogue. I think a lot of friends of mine will talk about things that have nothing to do with visual languages and that's okay. And then there's some of my friends that are strictly just like capital P painting. And that's all we'll talk about. And I think that that's okay too, but putting yourself in the room for me has been the most important thing where it's like, if I'm going to stay home another night and cook something, I already know how to cook and watch something I've already seen or play music. I've already seen like the idea of things just being new is super transformative, like new gallery today, a new talk tonight. I'm going to randomly play, you know, for the last month, I've just been playing all Quincy Jones albums. I was just like, Oh, that's what I'm doing this month. I really am interested in this sound and like, what about it do I like? And like, letting everything have a, a uh, potential like interaction instead of cutting things off. Uh, and, in, and what that means is like, if you're interested in like the way the grass is growing in between the bricks on your porch, like make some little drawing about it. Like what color is there? Where is the light hitting? Is it, you know, like those types of interactions of like letting the art be just as important as anyone else's job is super important. And then like, if you want to be the best basketball player, like you're going to be dribbling, shooting and playing scrimmage games all day, every day. To, you know, that to me is what I equated it to. Like I just play my instrument and I'm just trying to like 
while out and make people feel something um, and also unlearn something and relearn something and question something like letting it be something so much more than just about one painting or one thing like the artist, the, the longevity, the trajectory, that's just like a very, very much for me an emotional, like in the heart thing. It's not necessarily about one set show or one set thing I make, like just trying to keep almost like knocking on that door. Um, and you just keep, keep knocking and keep knocking. Yeah, Raja? Um, I'm curious if you had a mentor or mentors that you feel like were a support system for you um to sort of i don't know either for giving you advice on your work as you're working or uh, just some other kind of uh support to, to help you in your career yeah i i totally have been uh you know back to the kind of skate park with all my pads on metaphor like i i very much have offered free labor uh, I'm working for photographers working for sculptors working for artists um, and then finally, I got a little bit of money from that work. And then all of a sudden, I had the first time where I could go buy paint and stretcher bars for myself and not for the artist I'm working for. You know, like I, I come from a space where I was making images because I had a camera. I wanted to make all these things. I just had no money and no place to do it. So I would go to SVA or NYU in New York, pull out, you know, 96 paintings from their trash can at the end of every semester take the paintings off those bars. Okay. In one year, I have 200 paintings for free. I just had to buy the canvas by the yard. And like, I was using coffee and pencil, you know? So it was like, I never let the money, the studio, any of these kind of like, Oh, I don't have the space I want. It's like, no, like that's all just like personal, like excuse stuff. Um, and when I, in terms of mentors, it was like, you know, I worked for um, one painter who like, it was just like very obvious in terms of like, oh, you just accept these things that make you feel a certain way and you be your truest self. And that was so liberating for the first time seeing someone say, wow, this blue of their jacket makes me feel really good. Or it reminds me of how my grandpa was in the Navy in Ukraine and did it. And you're like, holy, oh, you know, it's just blue. But like, you just took it a whole new place. And like that actually gave me immense value to like depict, let's say a tribe called Quest Song, dissect all of their cadences and references and the, the melodic tones and the sampling, like that same type of rigor can be in the work. And just working for artists really showed me that it's like, this is just bilateral to making a car, making a, you know, a nice chair, making a movie, you know, you just let it be something so much, like so valuable to you and important that it becomes that because your passion and your honesty and what you spend your time doing is is proven um but in terms of mentors it's like any older artist that you like or don't like has been you know i, I could never thank you know the teachers that i've had in these residencies or people i've worked for it's like uh yeah incredible way to know exactly what you want to do or what you don't want to do how you want to run your studio, how you don't want to run your studio. I, I was able to work for people that were um, bo both. <laughs> and then you kind of take parts that you love and you leave the rest. But I think in terms of like working for an artist or um, putting yourself in the room, archiving someone's negatives or looking through their stuff with them, like that's just the, to me, the best thing ever. It's just like you're with, you know, someone teaching you how to swing a golf club. It's like, it doesn't, it doesn't get much closer to the thing um, without interacting with another person who's doing that thing. Um, so yeah, in terms of mentorship, like artists that are younger than me, artists that are way older than me, artists that have no career, artists that have a very big career, artists that have residencies, artists that are putting up electrical all around our counties and our places that we don't give any time of day, generally speaking, artists who are doing your latte art, artists who are making, you know, really brilliant food that you sit down with people you love and like talk about life with. Like, to me, there are so many ways where that like close looking, that mentorship, that care, like I just let a lot of things live in that arena. And I learned that from people, um, older artists who can, who can talk about art in a way that actually has um, deep emotional and serious ties. You know, I know some artists that are more serious than 
anyone I've ever met. And like growing up, I thought art was just this like, oh, we go, go throw some paint on the ground. And like, there is just a, a vast communication process in, in terms of like an artisan, you know, think about throughout history, if someone's making a great breastplate, you want to learn how to make a great breastplate, you just go work for this blacksmith for 20 years. Like that to me was how I looked at it, where like I was learning how to stretch canvas, how to make work, how bigger sculptural stuff was coming into the studio from these other artists. I was like, oh, wow, like I can, I can just like go find some found things and, and stack them on top of each other, take some photos, teach myself, you know, the Adobe suite. And all of a sudden I have a camera, I do my whole like creative agency thing just from being on YouTube, just from learning from other artists, just from, so yeah, like I just treat everything as very much a learning experience and just trying to be a sponge of like, so much life and then just speak my truth or my authentic attempt at getting through life um, is really where my practice resides. And I think as it evolves, there is more opacity that I need to kind of nurture and stop, you know, word vomiting all the time. But I'm just like a passionate person who believes in like a little bit of a ripple effect where like, wow, if all eight of us just try really hard to like be better in real time and go affect change at the coffee shop, at the grocery store, with our family, with each other, it's like, oh, wow, those are eight people like leading by example. That's crazy. Um, and that to me is really exciting. And I think art has that potential to be a magnet, to bring people who are empathetic, to bring people who care um, into a conversation more seriously and more honestly. Um, the, the amount of virtue signaling and like uh, acting quickly over the last year, if you will, is like a big turnoff. And I think if you're an empath and you have deep emotionality, it's like you can't fake the funk. And now we just have to like be able to put it into something. Um, but any way to get in an older artist studio, foundries, ceramic studios, paint classes, any of that, I fully wholeheartedly believe in. Thank you. I appreciate that. We're out of time, but Chase, oh, thank you guys so much for the wonderful and sobering conversation today. Um, I feel awake and I haven't even had coffee today. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, thanks for talking to us. Um, and hopefully we see you again soon. Yes, definitely. And I'm so upset that I missed the Robert Cole Scott at Portland Museum. So I just hope you guys saw that. Um, it was so good. good. But yeah, this was great. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. And I'm sorry for the Wi-Fi snafu in the beginning, but I'm really happy uh, that we got to get through it all. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, have a good day.